Rockin' Larry Lockin' with Pleiadian Express Productions, Pleiadian Talk. Um, we just had a little snafu on Google Hangouts, so we're back. Um, I, I'm honored to have as my guest Robert Potter. Rob is, of course, the creator of the website The Promise Revealed. He's also got his own awesome YouTube show and radio show called Victory of Light. And it is an honor to have him here with me. Um, I listened to him for years and really respect him and really love his smooth flow. And I know that there's a lot of things I wanted to get into with him, but Rob, thank you for your patience and putting up with that little Google Hangout uh, snafu. And well, welcome back, and thank you for. No, no worries. We'll just start off here. Whatever uh, you wanted to ask me, and we can go forward from there. Well, you know, I wanted to start off actually with talking a little bit about your, you know, your upbringing. But then, you know, you had mentioned something really interesting about this interdimensional travel that is really going to come into the forefront of the public's perception. So, you know, maybe we'll just start off with talking a little bit about your upbringing and, you know, what kind of things you were into. You know, I know I mentioned maybe George Adamski, things of that nature early on, but I'll quit rattling and let you uh, go for it. Sure. Well, I can start off a little bit with my personal upbringing was, um, you know, my father, I was born in Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco, which I was told is a pituitary gland of the planet <laughs> and Mount Shasta is a crown chakra but um, it's very interesting um, you know my um, well my father was Australian was an airline pilot and we moved to Phoenix until I was four my sister was born and then my mother and my father divorced my father continued to work for the airline and eventually uh, moved to Hawaii for many years and um, worked on um, uh, that level and my mother uh, was uh, working on the stock exchange in Laguna Beach a place called Dean Witter and she um, went ahead and you know t wrote all the stocks on the chalkboard this is back in the early 60s and I was growing up in Laguna Beach which is pretty idyllic now my my grandmother lived there and my great-grandmother was uh, Catherine Tiffany Catherine Tiffany was a socialite. Her father invented a special type of green glass that became very popular. And she was married to um, uh, a gentleman named Irving Romer. So she was Irving, she was Catherine Tiffany Romer. Now, now Irving uh, wrote, a book, wrote a magazine called The Printer's Inc. It was, it's now called The New Yorker. And that magazine became very famous for chronicling the abuse of children and immigrant labor in the early 1900s, kind of like Upton Sinclair at the Jungle. He reported on that type of activity and it became the foundation for the Be Better Business Bureau, which is now the Con uh, Bureau of Consumer Affairs, kind of a watchdog agency calling out uh, corruption in production and in uh, products. Um, so um, anyway, my great grandmother was a, a socialite. She was on one of the first flights of Pan Am to cross the Atlantic. There's a picture of her on the front page of the New York Times. I have Catherine Tiffany Romer, uh, you know, travels to uh, I forget London or Paris on the first transatlantic Pan Am flight. It's kind of like a Paris, Paris Hilton every day. Uh, but she was very involved in the spiritualist movement and did fund um, and become close to Ernest Holmes and Mary Baker Eddy of Religious Science and Science of the Mind. Uh, um, each of those are, were profound spiritual movements trying to give a, a metaphysical understanding and the foundation uh, of uh, spiritual activities in the multidimensional aspect of the universe. My mother used to play with uh, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, they were kind of friends. So my mom grew up in kind of a spiritual background, which kind of gave me, a, you know, an open-ended uh, spiritual background. On my website, thepromisedrevealed.com, I talk about the time when I first started to think about metaphysical matters at the age of eight. And I asked my mom, I said, what's out there in the universe? And she goes, well, it goes on forever. And I kind of laughed. I couldn't forever it just doesn't didn't make sense and uh, she goes what do you think it, it, it you think it ends and they go yeah it has to end somewhere she goes where a wall a chain link fence and then she said what's on the other side this really got me thinking I had a basement bedroom I went downstairs 
and a light m maneuvered into the center of my window. And I actually um, had my first uh, contact, uh, telepathic communication with my space family at the age of eight. And I was asking many questions and I seemed to receive answers and I got a lot of different information then. And then, then my next contact came a little later in life. Uh, living in Laguna Beach was pretty idyllic. My mother married a, a pretty wealthy guy. He never worked a day in his life. His family <laughs> used to ran, run coal up the Allegheny River. Uh, so he kind of like he owned uh, the coal concession uh, so he was in with the big money. He talked about the Mellons and the Carnegies and the Morgans. They were like contemporaries and his family uh, uh, grew up in Pennsylvania. He was extremely prejudiced um, and, um, you know, thought the Nazis should have won, that kind of stuff. And as we find out now, they sort of did. But um, he was very generous, a nice guy, but, you know, definitely close-minded and ignorant so kind of cabal like not being an official member but definitely a cabal type person uh, at least in his mental thinking so I kind of had this dark darker uh, reality construct he wasn't involved in anything just his belief system you know I was able to witness it and my mom eventually divorced him and um, I was big into sports, water sports. We had a house on the beach for many years, and it was very beautiful down there. And uh, we had quite a life. I actually used to travel to Lake Mead a lot, right near Victor One, where Rally and Thor is. And that's probably where they noticed me. I'm not sure, but um, we our boat used to travel directly <laughs> under where their ship is, leaving out of the Lake Mead Harbor. We did a lot of water skiing and stuff. So I had a pretty privileged. Uh, life as a youth, um, when you look at it, uh, and when I look at it in retrospect, living on the beach, I water polo, skiing, volleyball, and um, I became quite involved in water polo and swimming. I was uh, captain of the teams and the most valuable player repeatedly on on uh, all the years I played, and we went to the end of the finals and got second place in Southern California, which is kind of like the, the best water pole in the United States is in Southern California. So I went to a great school, UCSB, and I uh, ended up leaving there. But to go back to my metaphysical leanings at the age of, uh, I think it was 16 years old uh, or 15, I was laying on the couch. I was reading the psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain. It said, if you want to, you know, levitate, you just focus your mind. And I just sat there and I couldn't, <laughs> I obviously wasn't levitating by thinking about it. And I was very interested in pyramids. I was talking to this in front of some people and this girl at school goes, well, I know the Pyramid Man. And I said, the Pyramid Man, really? So I knocked upon the door of Fred Bell and his uh, girlfriend at the time, her name was Louise Karen. We called her Bunny. And they had a little dog in the back there named Robbie. <laughs> and uh, so Fred wasn't home, but she said, you can hang out here. And she says, come into the temple. And I took my shoes off. And Fred was quite the Renaissance artist. He was into airbrush. And he uh, played music. And he was a pretty well-rounded individual and had a, uh, uh, a three-story house there at the top of the hill in Laguna Beach. And this began my association and with my mentor, teacher, and guide, Dr. Fred Bell. So at the age of 16, I think Fred was, uh, let's see, 14, he was uh, 27 or something when I uh, met him, 43, 57. So yeah, he was um, 14 years older than me. So, let's see, so 16, yeah, he must have been almost 30, 29 or 30. And um, he comes back home, and he's got 50 pyramids, gold-plated pyramids. So it was the very first time he'd ever made pyramids. He had been told to make them uh, through his mentor, Dwal Kool, who is a member of the Great White Brotherhood and the uh, material, non-material uh, aspect of the planetary spiritual government. 
And according to Fred, we worked in the ashram of the seventh ray, which is ceremonial order and magic. Fred was a master on the fifth ray of concrete science and knowledge. Now, his house was very uh, unique. We had a lot of experiences there, especially when the Pleiadians started coming around, and I should give a little history of that. Fred Bell grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. His father um, worked for Henry Ford and co-invented with Henry Ford together, they invented the automatic transmission and the alternator. Uh, Henry Ford had huge hemp fields uh, that he had, and he was very much into creating engines that would run on ethanol with hemp. That's the reason um, marijuana was made illegal, because Henry Ford wanted to run the world's cars on that, and that would have put... J.P. Morgan and the Standard Oil people out of business. So J.P. Morgan got together with Randolph Hearst, created a propaganda campaign against marijuana, claiming black people uh, smoked it and raped white women as a result. And we know all, the, sadness, all, yeah. all those stories there. So um, he was fixing television sets. They were really large with a very small screen back in 19, I think it was 52. Uh, and he was the uh, sharpest kid on his block. He was noticed as a child genius at the age of 15. He was invited to the university to study the shockwave of the atomic bomb under uh, Dr. Leonard Katz. So at this point, he's now working in subatomic physics. The government grabbed him at 16, almost 17 and uh, conscripted them into the Air Force, which was illegal, but they put him out in um, UCSB, actually, where he was at the ROTC, and he uh, became a PhD in physics at the age of 17. So he was one sharp cookie in the military. He then uh, uh, did his training, I think it was in Arkansas, and then they sent him to Point Reyes, California, which is the farthest westernmost point in California. He then uh, was the lead engineer electrical technician in charge of the entire radar installation. And they couldn't, you know, here comes this kid. He was 20 or 21, 20, out at um, Point Reyes. And uh, if anything went wrong with this, with a uh, set, they'd have to talk to this 20-year-old kind of smart, you know, triple Leo with a, you know, conjunct Jupiter at the ascendant. He has a super high intellect. Anyone who looked at his chart goes, is your friend a scientist? Does he work in physics? And so it's pretty obvious that he was very intelligent on this level. So in 1963, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he observed UFOs coming down at 15,000 miles an hour and vectoring off down to... Um, Cuba. And he put these reports in and they said, uh, oh, and they were burning them at the end of the ship. And so they said, Bell, uh, what's going on here? You keep putting these reports. You know, we burn these. And he goes, you can't do that, sir. Uh, code something, something says you must uh, report this to the public. And they go, yeah, wise guy. Okay. And they let it go for like a week. He put up with this. And he kept filling out the reports. He was pretty upset. And uh, so they Finally, um, they said, Bell, did you see a UFO? And he said, yes, sir, you know I did. We all did. And they had two MPs come in and arrest him, and they put him in the psychiatric ward, and he just said, look, give me an honorable discharge, and I'm out of here, and I won't raise this thing. So he got an honorable discharge, and he left the military, and he went to work for uh, Roswell, uh, or NASA, actually, and, um, not Roswell, I'm uh, thinking of, uh, uh, what is that, Rock, no, no. Rock, Rockefeller Center, no. No, uh, anyway, uh, he worked for JPL, um, at, uh, and, and, uh, NASA, um, anyway, so at NASA, down at, the, I think it was in Florida or at the Cape, or they were building it in Long Beach, I forget which, but he, um, 
observed faulty wiring. So he told them, he says, there's some bad wiring up here. This is not good. And they, he went to all of his people and complained up the chain. It wouldn't get to the top. So he went into the top offices and said, there is some faulty wiring here. I'm not happy with it, and we need to address this uh, electrical wiring. It's dangerous. And they fired him. And he put in a suit with the ALCU. Six months later, three men died at the Cape, exactly where he said it was. And they bowed down to him. They gave him his back pay and said, we want you the head of uh, electrical uh, checkout here at NASA, which he called never a straight answer. So <laughs> so he, uh, so then he, um, then he went to uh, uh, work with JPL. And that's when he went into the private sector. And at this point in time, he was also traveling frequently up to San Francisco. This is in uh, around the mid-60s now, uh, getting towards the late 60s. And he's going up to his teacher who came from India, and it's called the Siva Kalpa family. And you can look it up, S-I-V-A-K-A-L-P-A. -A -A. And he called him father. He was a Benares... Uh, um, um, enlightened guru who came to America in '66. He, I think, he had <laughs> something like uh, he had a, an, an odd thing. He had like uh, you know, 17 wives and 27 children or something. He was kind of like this guru in the '60s uh, thing. But he had a powerful presence. And according to Bunny, she was uh, with there when Fred was initiated, and Fred had developed pretty advanced into the metaphysical aspects of um, in the guru disciple uh, discipleship of opening up in, uh, the soul soul energies and Fred picked up a burning log and held it for about 10 minutes um, and he took it around and there were other people in the room and he did what's called RT he, he used a giant burning log as a flame and, it, and each person touch the flame and touch their third eye with it, kind of like in the Hindu tradition. So he became an initiate um, uh, pretty early on. And this allowed uh, a gentleman named uh, Alan Schwartz, who was also a member, respected Fred Bell greatly, who was a, a big money guy. He lived in uh, Bel Air um, and when I met him. And Alan back in the day, uh, you got to realize that this is the guru that started the flower children movement. So he was getting flack from the cops. A lot of kids were coming out there and he was giving teachings and stuff and said, you should have some music and dancing and love-ins in the park. And so all that started through father, as they called him. And uh, what he did was uh, he had Alan write a check for $250,000 back in 1967 or something and that was a lot of money then and he threw a a, a Mayor Joseph Alioto appreciation day and he didn't invite him <laughs> so so here he is you have a bunch of hippie kids um, we, we love Mayor Joseph Alioto and he predicted that Mayor Joseph Alioto would come from the crowd and shake his hand and Fred Bell had a picture uh, he showed me. It was taken on one of those old black and white uh, cameras that you'd shoot. And there was a picture of Mayor Joseph Alioto uh, shaking father's hand. So they didn't have any problems with the police after that. So that allowed the ashram to flourish. And Fred basically didn't have much contact with him by the time I saw him. Um, he... Um, father used to come, there was another devotee in um, Laguna who he would see, and I, I went down and I spent some time with him, and he never spoke. I spent probably, you know, 30 or 40 hours with him, maybe max, uh, and the guy never said a word. He just would sit there. And an interesting thing, when I was driving up the hill one day, he was in town to go see him. Uh, I was said to bring him a gift, so I bought him a flower, and I had had, it says, if you petition inwardly and ask the question, the guru will answer it. So I wanted to know about this breath of fire 
that I had learned about and, and was practicing. And it's a deep uh, yogic breath. And when I got there, he just started doing what I was doing. It's like, it's kind of a slow breath, and he just did it. So it answered my question. He knew. So that was Father, uh, a kind of a wise, sage-like guy. And he actually manifested a conscious exit from the body. He got everyone together and said, my time is done. And he sat in the full lotus and uh, passed over, I forget when that was, in the late 70s or early 80s. So Fred Bell learned from him, and he was passed off from father to Dwal Cool, which brings us back to the story of the pyramid. So uh, Fred Bell's house was paid for by Alan Schwartz, and, and he allowed Fred, he paid the down payment and intended for Fred to have that house. Um, uh, he had, uh, when Alan passed over, um, his wife took it over and allowed Fred to keep the house. He had to keep paying the mortgage on it. But anyway, so that vortex uh, from the time I met Fred in 74 until I think he moved there in 90 something was a, a major hub of activity and dissemination of knowledge to the world and I was witness and part of that activity and what was privately known by us as the ashram of the seventh ray. So this was a downstepping of higher dimensional forces in the communi communication place for extraterrestrial intelligences and other uh, beings to come there at that house and lots of scientists would come into that house and uh, learn through Fred the interdimensional physics of of their particular field of study. We used to sell pyramids, we developed a, a series of pyramid systems at a certain point in time Dwal Cool introduced Fred Bell into, into the Pleiadians. Now, an interesting fact, I was not aware of George Dansky in, in the early days, but I started to study the UFO phenomenon pretty heavily in the late 70s. Now, um, George Adamski used to live in Laguna Beach, as did uh, one of the disciples of Neem Karuli Baba, Bhagavan Das, and another one of those disciples named Bobby Brown and Krishna Das. Those three are very powerful singers. Bobby Brown's not known so well. I think he's in Europe now, but um, he, he was a friend and a great and a great singer. But anyway, so Laguna Beach, George Damsky lived on Nestal Road. Fred lived in his exact house. And before he moved to where he was now, he actually, a, a spaceship came uh, she opened the door and waved, and it was uh, Semyasi. And uh, he had a telepathic communication, and uh, she says, I'll see you uh, some in, in some time later, and you you will hear about, he goes, what's your name? He goes, She'll, you'll know my name from a person in a foreign land. And that was Billy Meyer. Mm, interesting, wow. So so that was the early backstory of Fred Bell's contact with uh, Semyasi. Now, Corey thinks Semyasi is um, uh, Maria Orsic, and that's not the person I remember. Um, he can say it. I don't buy it. Um, that's um, maybe true uh, that Maria Orsic uh, was posing as that, but, uh, and he claims that Wendell Stevens said that. I never heard that from Wendell, so I don't know. Um, and I don't, I'm not really sure it matters. She claimed to be a 320-year-old cosmonaut from the Pleiades, 360. And uh, I have no reason to doubt her. She didn't seem to be a liar. And Fred Bell had experiences where he would go on board the ship and they would give him uh, information about pyramids and pyramid designs and skater waves and many other things. He knew about the secret space program, the reptilians, but he never said a word. He kept his vows of silence. Uh, we did have some government gray activity in the early 80s um, around, the, around us, and uh, but we had other benevolent uh, 
uh, ET contact. So with Fred for many years, uh, I would say 10 or 12 years, I traveled the country. We would go to Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Seattle, uh, New York, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and I think they tried Florida once or twice with the, what's called the, uh, well, we did the National Health Federation, and then one of the guys that was doing that started the Whole Life Expo. His name was Alan, uh, no, um, yeah, it was Alan, uh, I can't remember his last name, but Alan um, was a, a, a good friend and devotee of Fred's, kind of, would come around, and uh, he gave us a free booth for the first Whole Life Expo. And uh, that really started the metaphysical New Age Fair type of information. So we did that for many years. Do you recall, Rob, about what year that might have been, that first uh, Conscious Life Expo? Gosh, I'm thinking 78, 79, 80, somewhere like that. But uh, it's changed. I think it's the, the new uh, or the Conscious Life. It's been transferred on the name and taken over, and it is what we know as the New Age Metaphysical fair. Now, a lot of the people in there were, you know, doing their thing and lots of great new health products. Fred was very much into health and vitamins and nutrition. And uh, we created the first uh, air purifiers. We actually started that field as well as lasers. In 1978, I remember in the backyard, we had a, one of the greatest uh, laser masters in the world. Fred Lord was a contemporary of Fred. And um, he developed a laser system that would pulse alpha, beta, delta, and theta frequencies. He showed me how to make it. This was in the old days of the breadboards. And I was uh, uh, assembling laser systems when I was 17 or 18 years old. Not an electrical engineer. I just like paint by numbers, just connect the wires, solder them, and make it work. I was working with grommets and, you know, the, the basics of uh, construction. We use plastic designs and put in the fuse and wire up the plugs. We also did that with negative ion generators, which was the uh, air purification. And we did that, and then there was a, a company called Living Air. Uh, they came out a year later. They bought one of our devices and then, you know, um, copied it <laughs> and went, went forward. But uh, it's all good. More air purification for people, the better. So I became an expert in negative ionization, uh, which is kind of a very similar, it's kind of like a Tesla coil, is what we were doing, is we, we would run the electricity through a Tesla coil, uh, or run the air, the fans would circulate through it, uh, uh, like a metal, we had a metal filter in there, which was electrified, so the air would drop the particulates inside the machine, and then we had a special technology, and I'm not going to say it right here, but we had a special technology that produces uh, the anew, or the ultimate physical atom. At the end of that, we had a special wire that came out to produce a, a negative ion. Now, this negative ion is very important for breath and uh, runs your blood, purifies your blood, and keeps you happy and healthy. And with all of the pollution in the air we were sharing with people how that worked oh I should talk about the lasers. so we built these lasers and we gave them for free to Stanford Irvine Japan and Germany Fred had contact with high-level scientists and we gave them four of these laser systems where they did studies and they found that lasers can increase white blood cell count if you place it on certain accurate puncture points under certain of the frequency modulations that we provided. So the entire laser system in, in Japan and China really took off with it. The, uh, Germany as well um, started to create these laser systems now that you have your combs and your head for bald hair and legs. It's used quite a bit in sports medicine these days with uh, very beneficial results. And I actually have a company in Japan uh, that, uh, or I'm sorry, China, that creates an incredible laser watch. It's called the Promise Light Watch on my website that you can um, uh, purify your blood. And we've got studies on that. It's really good for people with diabetes or high blood pressure or anything like that. So um, anyway, so that was the beginning days with Fred. I'm going to let you ask another question here, I guess. I just... Uh, 
No, it, it was along those lines. I was just curious as to how much um, pushback that you guys may have had from, you know, the U.S. government, U.S. businesses, things of that nature, um, if, if any, any kind of pushback that you guys may have received as far as being a pioneer in that type of work. Well, well, I... I, I was a kid at that time. I was basically the number one assistant. I knew everything. Uh, Fred didn't spend much time at those booths. He would be up in the room and come down for his lectures. I ran the booth with, uh, by then, uh, we went through his, uh, he had another wife. Uh, we called her Sweet Thing, and that's Kim Bell. And I'm working with her daughter, Alana Bell, and we're producing uh, now the uh, receptors and projectors that Dr. Bell made. He has another daughter who after he passed over is also making those, but we're making those as well. We're bringing the prices down a little bit there, so uh, people are interested in that technology. That's not on my website yet, but it will be up soon. It's called the Receptor and Projector. And uh, those are Palladian and Andromeda devices, but so we didn't receive much pushback. Um, Fred um, used to work at NASA, and he you know, I was sitting in his living room when Alan Holt, during the Reagan administration, um, he was eating cereal with, uh, I think it was uh, Megan, or was it, uh, yeah, I think it was with uh, Alana Bell, the first daughter, choosing diapers, and he goes, Rob, I want you to hear this. He put on speakerphone and goes, hey, Alan, how's it going? It was Alan Holt, the guy who invented the engine that worked in the vacuum, the liftoff from the moon. And he said, uh, Fred, we want you to join the Star Wars program. Uh, program. I'm inviting you personally on behalf of Ronald Reagan. We'd like you to join. And Fred said, no, Alan, you know, I don't do that. I, I don't work with, uh, with you guys anymore. And he goes, are you sure, Fred? We really could use you there. And Fred was known as an, a laser expert. He was uh, very involved in that um, in his private company. Um, as I mentioned, anyway, he, he ended up leaving Rockwell after he, after he built the, the, he worked on the guidance system that helped the um, Soyuz and the Russian docking system uh, in the, uh, it was a quartz calibrated crystalline guidance system that allowed two spaceships to meet in the exact point in time and space. And he did a little bit of work there. He also uh, uh, had his own company. He developed a uh, $25 million company. He was flying around in private jets and had his own limousine and all this stuff. And uh, he was had a shaker table and oscilloscope that was the best in the world. So he'd go into all these underground secret bases and he got an overview of the government secret space program. He had top security clearance and he would go in and test and calibrate equipment. And he did that for years. And then, um, uh, of course, he has a metaphysical life going on, and he's uh, now going, being passed on in the, he had his initiations and started his kind of uh, teachings with the Palladians and stuff. Babaji also appeared to him. And, um, and so that was my mentor and teacher. We traveled the country. Um, he was a master, not an ascended master. Um, he had he was human. He had faults. He was under pressure. In the end, he drank a little bit. Um, he talked about vegetarianism, but would fall astray from that from a little bit. But um, he was a great man. Uh, I loved him a lot. We were kind of on the outs when he passed away. Uh, I think his drinking uh, got a little bit of the better of him, and he. Uh, we had some some uh, financial <laughs> issues where he owed me some money. I won't bring up that stuff. But basically, Fred was a great teacher. We had a lot of experiences. We drove across country once, and he got to fly in a spaceship. And we went out in the desert going to New York, and, and he goes, pull over here. And I'm thinking, Fred never stops. We drive to New York. It was like, he drive, I drive. We went straight forward. It was 24 hours of driving with Fred. To get to New York. I mean, that engine just would go and go and go and go. And uh, we never stopped a hotel. We had a van. Uh, one person slept in the back. Uh, uh, his, uh, he usually have his girlfriend or wife with him at the time. And we just go back and forth across the country. It was pretty wild. And uh, he pulls off near um, 
on this 395 in the uh, California desert. And uh, I go, what are we stopping here? And a sleep beam came over me, and I just fell asleep. I just dropped. His girlfriend was already asleep, and he comes back in real excited. says, okay, Rob, you're driving. Let's go. And so I get in the front, and I light some incense. He goes, don't do that. And I go, why? And he goes, oh. And so I let him, I go, incense is okay. So we're driving along, and we're on this back dirt road that he had taken us off to, telepathically glided, where he had had a meeting point and actually got to drive the spaceship. So I didn't know about it, and there's two guys in military jeep. The Secret Space Program Command had known the spaceship had landed, and we're going, what's going on? I go, and he goes, what's that? And the guy goes, what's that smell? They said, it's incense. Why? And I think, thinking, what are these, what's this two military jeeps out here stopping us in the middle of the desert? Really weird. And he never told me about that. I had to figure it out. After he told it in public in the book, I was like, you know. He was very tight-lipped about what happened. I never got answer questions. I finally cornered him when I was about 40 years old. And I go, you know more than you're telling, aren't you? You're sworn to secrecy. And he said, yes. And so there's a secrecy thing going on there and I'm not really down with, and that's why they don't probably kill me everything is because I will tell the world there are no more secrets. It's time for the truth to come out, and if we abide in the truth, the truth will abide in us. And there's a spiritual aspect to this, too. I have other spiritual mentors beyond Fred Bell that came forward. When I was 19 years old, I didn't realize it. It was blocked from my awareness, but I had a contact with Babaji of the Yogananda Autobiography of Yogi. And just like in the book Autobiography of Yogi, where he didn't recognize his first contact, I as well was blocked from knowing who it was. He taught me the Kriya Yoga and the science of the still breath, and I was told by another great white brotherhood initiate that he acts as an initiator from uh, Earth-based teachers to extraterrestrial, kind of a galactic doorway there. But I didn't realize this for years. It was like 20 years later, uh, all of a sudden I had the memory of that experience, and he unblocked me to realize that um, I'd had this experience with, yoga, with uh, Babaji. It was a brief experience, uh, probably 30 minutes, and it was a meditation training for me in how to use the breath form. And I was young. I was 19 or 20. I could, you know, almost stand on one hand and uh, full lotus. I was very athletic and very yogic oriented and very healthy. So um, it was a good uh, learning technique for me. And Fred had this experience as well. And then he was passed on to the Pleiadians and Samyasi. Now, um, there's lots of unanswered questions. Billy Meyer um, had uh, sent a group. We appeared in Germany in 1987 with his third wife, Frauke, absolute sweetheart. I love her to death. Uh, beyond me, she knows more about, uh, you know, Fred Bell and Pyridine. I probably know the technology a little better than her, but she ran the company for 12 years and... Um, was uh, very instrumental, and um, I would consider my equal in understanding the pyramids. Uh, maybe not metaphysically. Um, she wasn't really, um, I don't know, it seemed like the, the women weren't as much involved in the contact as we were. But uh, she uh, was in Germany. Fred had a concert, and um, Billy Meyer's group, the Butcher, Guido Musburger, and a couple others came down the aisles. And there was like 300 people in the room. You don't have contact with her, and you're a liar, and blah, 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 blah. Fred didn't say anything. The next day, Fred was giving his concert based on the wraparound sound of the holographic sound technology of the Pleiadians. And a spaceship appeared over Garmisch Partkirchen. There are pictures, and over 300 witnesses left the left the room, went outside, and looked up and watched the spaceship dance about uh, being chased by Swiss Mirage jet fighters trying to m remove it from the space. They cordoned off the town with the police, and it was quite a show. So 
uh, that put to rest whether Fred has contact with the Palladians or not. <laughs> well, certainly, Rob, certainly there's always been a contingency, it seems like, from the Meyer group to, um, uh, I don't know, you know, not validate somebody else's contact with the Pleiadians, whether it, you know, was Dr. Fred Bell or, you know, other people as well that, is, you know, claimed to have contact. A lot of people there, I don't know, especially in the later years of Meyer's group of try to kind of, you know, say that they're the only ones to have had this kind of contact, but like we were talking about one time, you know, on a, on a phone call, you're like, it's an energy that, you know, you tune into as far as the Pleiadians go, and it certainly seems like, I know I'm all over the place, but in the 1970s, you know, it, I was born, for instance, in the year 75, and it just seems like yeah. a lot of things happened, yeah, I know, that's why I've got this thing with 75, you know, and all the things that went down that year, and some of the things I've heard from you over the years, Cobra running into the Michael, uh, you know, underground, and, and that story, and it just, it seems like the 70s were a real gateway for them to, that, that they were really thick here, you know, and it, and it transcends racial lines, it's not like that they're, a lot of people want to think that they're more, I don't know, they're more uh, Scandinavian type or they're more indigenous types, but really anybody on the earth, it seems like, is, you know, can tune into that energy. Am I right? Am I wrong? Does that... Oh, yeah, everyone can tune, everyone's tuning into that energy more or less. Now, um, I want to clear up one thing. Um, Fred didn't say he ran into Michael. Um, I'm not sure what his... Experience. That was Cobra. Sorry, Rob. I meant yeah, Cobra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he... Um, with uh, Semyasi, it was actually her fault. Uh, now, you got to realize when I was 17 or 18 and 19, um, I was getting uh, Billy Meyer's contact notes sent to us from Wendell Stevens on mimeograph paper about the time you were born. It's a kind of, you don't know, wouldn't remember this, but in school we used to get mimeograph. It had a certain smell. You'd like huff it to get high or something. But anyway... <laughs> uh, so I was reading Billy Meyer's contact notes about his, his travels in outer space, seeing dinosaurs, the Amazon women, and his various descriptions of his travels aboard the ships to kind of get Earth people broken in and acquainted that there's lots of life out there. Now, she did say in her 250th or 251st contact notes, because I was sensitive, but why is Billy Meyer bashing Fred? Uh, and I'm not sure he was, but his followers were, he was told he was the only contact. And when they asked him, what about this contact? They said, no, no, no. They, they denied Dr. Frank Stranges. So here's the answer. All of these groups do not work exactly and get together. There's not like a, there, there's a various commands and forces that are working with the earth for the liberation but they do not consult each other on every action or activity. They have their own bases. They work within their own ethical laws and principles based on, uh, you know, allowance and non-interference. And there's a certain, as we know now, the, the what Corey calls the, the Mohammed Accords, the Galactic Codex, that they certain groups will not violate. So the Palladians were very hesitant to become involved. Fred wanted more interaction. Why aren't you guys doing this and that? We have a bad situation here. How come, you know, you're not engaging more? Well, some of the Pleiadians, in fact, there were 200 of them that were involved in Atlantis that uh, were sent here as punishment, kind of to help the Earth as service for their bad deeds. And they continued in their negativity. They had sex with women, the giants, men of renown. Uh, and there was another uh, ET that was the head of that group named Semiasis, not Semiasi, but Semiasis. And that that uh, teacher said, look, you guys can't do this. It's in the Bible. And he said, look, I, I can't, I'm going to be blamed for this if you guys do it. And they said, screw this. We're going to have sex with earth women. And that kind of um, uh, w was... One of the negative things that came from the Pleiades. The Pleiades is a giant star system, and many different races have moved there and come there. In fact, Corey Good talked about the little Mayan Oompa Loompas that came here from the Mayan time that Dr. Frank Stranges told me there were many groups that were just uh, achieved a level of spiritual unity, and they just left the planet. And they moved on, and they were allowed, given spaceship, and that small group was giving, uh, joined the Confederacy and, and moved and has their own 
uh, lifestyle on their own world uh, somewhere in the Pleiades. So there's lots of things going on that we don't really know about, but be aware that this group doesn't know what that group's doing, this group's doing this, and that group's doing this. There's not like a giant, uh, you know... Uh, there's different factions. I, I'm really yeah. brought I'm really glad you brought up, brought this up because the Pleiades is vast, and there is I mean, there's endless races of different beings there with different agendas of some types. It's not you know it's like in Los Angeles you've got one you don't just have one section section of the Los Angeles police. You got various districts. I mean you know any kind of entity has several different factions within it, and so I don't think that gets um, you know talked about a lot. And and I like what you're saying about this person doesn't know these this person's guides and. I think we get lost in that a lot of what one person's interpretation is, and they want to come across that, you know, that's the only way to look at it. And I mean, it just seems like, you know, you, you get that with the secret space program as well, you know, and I certainly love listening to everybody's thoughts on that, um, whether it's you or Richard C. Hoagland or Michael Salia, Corey or Cobra or, you know, Richard Dolan, but, you know, everybody's got a, their own little Joseph Farrell. They've all, they've all got their own unique take on it, and it seems like a lot of it is... I mean, all of it is right in some measurement, you know what I mean? It's just, I guess, figuring this all out. Yeah, everyone has their own viewpoint, and we have to respect that. I know Corey, from my feeling, he's absolutely real. He's told uh, everything about his experiences. He doesn't have a lot of metaphysical background, and he doesn't have a, a large spiritual background in dealing with uh, what's going on and... Um, all this stuff. He has a, you know, a soul background, which is very high integrity and spiritual in nature. But um, I think they chose him uh, for that reason. I mean, he's very stoic. I mean, um, his face doesn't move. He doesn't react. He's not like, uh, you know, he he's very kind of reserved. You know what I mean? But he's, he's like he's like somebody that's like just this normal dude that this happened to you know what I mean and you can hear that totally in his voice when you hear him on the radio too it's it, this just information he's just been a part of this and it's there's no flamboyancy about what he's trying to promote or how he's trying to act you know what I mean it's kind of like uh, he's almost like a I won't say as stiff as a Sergeant Joe Friday but you know what I mean it's just the facts to him no yeah well I mean I his uh, recent video log uh shows he's very warm. Once he gets to know you uh, with with David Wilcock, he was smiling and laughing and kind of making jokes. He has a dry sense of humor. but um, And he has to be careful. He doesn't interject his own opinions or anything too much, which kind of leaves us in the lurch. And the other thing is he's very empathic, so he doesn't want to freak anyone out. Um, you know, he said his thing about Semyasi, and there may be... You know, he said that uh, she's Maria Orsek, and, you know, I'm not really sure she was giving very high-level spiritual information, but um, had to say that she was from the Pleiades not to violate certain laws, which doesn't sound right to me, and um, I, I... I agree. I heard David Wilcock mention that, I think, with Coriani, and I, it just doesn't... I'm not saying what he's saying is wrong, but it doesn't really resonate with me either, um, you know, as far as that goes, but... You know, well, that's just... it's okay. We, we're going to learn what's happening in the end. I don't take personal offense to it. I, I query it a little bit. Now, you know, at, when he came to the conference, and I wanted to give the what I call the real secret space program, and that takes us on to my other mentors in this field. I learned a tremendous amount from Alex Collier. What a great guy. has a lot of experience. Shout out to Alex. Yeah, Alex is great. He really gave us the reptilian, the hard-nosed stuff that we didn't know. And then, uh, you know, David Icke picked up on it with the Krita Mutwa and, uh, you know, that type of thing. And then Cobra, uh, as a further succession of the of the implant matrix, I had a very unique teacher in the late 70s, early 80s named Gabriel Green. And I worked closely with um, uh, Michael O'Legion, we lived together for a month or two, and he trained me a lot in the brotherhood and, and uh, what's called the uh, Solar Cross Foundation contacts of Corton, uh, Manka, Lalour, uh, Soltec, and many of uh, Soltec from Alpha Centauri, and many of these other groups. There's different 
uh, being from different races that um, have been working here and discovering what's going on. Our planet is extremely aggressive and competitive. They've known this for hundreds of thousands of years and we've always destroyed ourselves and issues have happened. So there's a certain type of radiation here that has kind of mutated us in an aggressive way. So there's a, they found a certain gas that's missing boron and so the good guys are have been stabilizing this and it's a process that's taken you know, 50, 60 years where they're rectifying kind of like a program in the, let's call it the atomic structure of, of the nature of the earth that's going to allow us to, um, um, you know, achieve a higher vibration of consciousness. And we all, we still can, but it's very difficult. So you also have this, these hostile groups, and I don't want to go into those right now, but uh, that are doing things. So the, the good guys, the Solar Cross, uh, I was listening to these channelings in a book called Star Wards. I recommend you get that. Really cool uh, on eBay. It's probably expensive, but uh, I think you can get the download version, but it's really good. But can you repeat the name, Rob, of it? I'm sorry. Star Wards? Wars? W-A-R-D-S by Richard Miller. And these are the early contact uh, telepathic communication taking place in 1956. He was a former military officer that was uh, the Jesse Mantel case where the, the guy went up and lot, lots of weird stuff going on in regards to that. Um, and it's hard to know what actually happened if he died or if he was taken aboard, but um, landed in a farmer's field. That's an old ufology story, but the government, um, of course, we know has been hiding a lot of stuff and was just getting into bed with the Nazis um, around 56. So there was another secret program going on behind the scenes with uh, corporate conglomerates. They went through the military, sort of. They went through the uh, corporate conglomerations and they kept sectioning themselves off. So. There were certain aspects in the military that didn't really know what's going on and wanting to know what's going on, and they were using military abduction programs and, and uh, isolating certain type of individuals from early age through standardized testing and special testing and teams coming in and choosing certain kids for special programs. And uh, Corey Good would be one of those. Were these the initial my lab programs, so to speak, and stuff like Andrew Bashago talks about? Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. Well, Andrew was in through his father. They they take people who are close in. They do a generational where they know who you are, and you know, you know, Andrew's father didn't know the whole scene, what was going on there. They were working on uh, uh, a certain aspect, Project Pegasus, with uh, jump rooms and temporal distortions. The Montauk project from the uh, uh, Etheridge and the Philadelphia experiment technology that was moved and a lot of some black magic energy going on there with uh, there are certain things about sound vibrations and incantations uh, with uh, uh, one of those uh, bad guys I can't remember but uh, and Montauk and lots of stuff going on so um, behind the scenes Exactly. You know, and I've heard you mention this before. I'd like to get your take on the uh, 1962, and I know that I think Hoagland talks about this as well, the joint mission to Mars with uh, the Soviet Union. Do you believe that that took place? Oh, of course. Um, I, I think um, they may have even had uh, other stuff. I saw that film uh, when they landed. They go, if they ever take the wrap off of this thing, it'll be the biggest day in history, May, May something, 1962. And they showed it, and, and all of a sudden the ground went, and we have life. Oh, my God, there's life on Mars. So this might have been the the beginning of the the joint. Uh, well, this is co corporate conglomerate space, secret space program. So you have all this positioning, the salt talks and the things. It was basically control and conquer different groups of the Illuminati, Council of 300, and the New World Order early days were at the highest levels working together. And in the meantime, they're posturing uh, to fool the people to give more money to the military on both sides. We have to protect from the Russians. And now it's like 
constant terror. We have to protect from terrorists. It's just uh, all manufactured, all designed to lead us into product, you know, a, a problem, conflict, and resolution. So they provide the conflict and they provide the answer. And the answer is more money from you. Ask them to take away rights. And that's actually recorded as far back as Rome. Claudio, there's a quote that says, you know, you know, we had to attack the people or they wouldn't get involved. So they did some false flags in Roman times. They had to attack the regular Roman populace so they would give more money for protection of themselves. So it basically comes down to money, power, and control and those who worship that. Now, the spiritual side that Semyasi taught us is do not seek the manifest. You know, you seek the spiritual relationship and the outer world will coincide. So you have two different sides of this story. You have the absolute spiritual Christ principle, which is, there's two principles. The pyramid principle is the principle of matter made flesh. A physical shape can provide a life force energy, and that's the pyramid. It has an aura. And you don't see that in other atomic structures or... or uh, what they call, if you look under an electron microscope, everything has electron shapes. So you have these, we like to think of atoms as like there's a neutron, you can't, and a proton in the center, you can't even see, and then there's electrons revolving around them like planets. Well, they don't revolve around like in our particular planets, they actually go and they move into one position and dance and move, kind of like when a planet gets affected by retrograde. It stays in one place, and then it moves around. So this macro microcosm uh, relationship of the universe is demonstrated in this type of um, uh, physics that is known as uh, subatomic physics. So you're able to see what these different shapes are. Titanium has a cross shape. All these different subatomic structures have their unique shapes. By the way, the carbon atom is pyramid shaped. Uh, the diamond is pyramid shaped. Copper is two pyramids, one point to point like a black widow and has a drawing effect. And uh, that's why people value gold. That's why people value diamonds and rubies and emeralds and sapphires because they have crystalline energy. This pyramid shaped energy along the ray lines, there's seven uh, notes to the musical scale, there's seven colors to the rainbow, and there's seven frequencies of uh, coherent light which um, can be seen in lasers. But uh, in the body we have seven endocrine glands, and these endocrine glands have magnetic centers which are called chakras. And these are the anchor points for the soul in the body. So with this higher dimensional physics being understood intimately by the New World Order and these bad guys are able to manipulate and jam our frequencies. And they do this through vaccinations, chemtrails, genetically altered foods, harp, elf waves along your electrical lines. And so the average human has a lot of things to overcome. It's like you're in prison all the time, right? Hey, wake up, it's time to go to prison. I mean school. Yeah, look at the chemtrails covering the sky. Yeah, it's a great day. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, then it's time to go to uh, high school. Let's go to prison here. And they're training you for the workforce. And then they get you into, into college, and then the, they select you, and then you go into workforce. They're denying certain physics. You know, as David Icke says, they give you algebra. What the fuck is that? That's going to turn you off to math. There's no use for it. It's just a, a bamboozled, uh, you know, technology scares a lot of people off of math and thinking and uh, school doesn't teach you to think and now they're giving the parents so much fucking homework with your kids I mean you got these report cards to see what the homework they're doing it's all bollocks as David Icke says I just saw him in Los Angeles brilliant what a master putting it all together great graphics from A to Z he didn't go into the space program but really really shows the lies in the controlled matrix, giving evidence. You know, and I saw as a big new Brzezinski talk about crashing a plane and, and terrorist activity that he wrote in the mid-70s as a viable uh, program. Uh, there's another guy in these council and foreign relations and these think tanks and how to manipulate the population. Um, 
with these false flags in Cuba uh, that was going on uh, to uh, create conflict and an excuse for people to give money uh, to the military. Now the military works with the CIA at the highest levels and they deal drugs and arms around the world. And they use the secret space program to ferry coke and this type of stuff through these high level Illuminati members in the world. So um, we're kept anesthetized and ignorant. Uh, they create the media has people looking at Car Kim Kardashian's butt, no matter how nice it is. I mean, that family's got to be mind controlled uh, from the get go. I mean, yeah, Rob, I wouldn't let him run a pencil stand if it were me. Like, if I own a business, I wouldn't let any of the Kardashians run a pencil stand. I mean, but yeah, exactly. I I'm not even turned on. They're they're so mind controlled and brainless. Well, just... well, they might be, but they're they're humans, and they may be victims like Michael Jackson. <laughs> that poor guy. Um, you know, he uh, was definitely having sex with young kids. He had been abused and abused. I mean, the, the issues going on with him, he was a uh, abused from a, a very young age and went through tremendous amount of torture. They bought out a lot of talent in him, and but they had handlers. His father, I think, was a, a, a pedophile, and he was um, uh, told, his, you know, you're going to make your kids rich. You know, you have to do all this and that, but that will come out in the later. But Michael Michael Jackson, uh, Elvis Presley, the Colonel was his boss. Okay, so you have uh, Barbara Streisand, uh, Neil Diamond, and most of the kids that come out of Disney and Epcot Center have been enhanced as well. They they use a mind control program now that's a little bit nicer. It's it's kind of like an ecstasy. So people will do things led by ecstasy as opposed to torture. Some of them are under mind, you know, I, I have a feeling Cher, Madonna, a lot of these guys, Beyonce, very well may be under that. Do uh, you think methamphetamine played a role in that, especially you hear some of the things about Mickey Rooney? I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering how much the drug, if it any, methamphetamine made a played under, you know, used in that part of that mind control for... Well, methamphetamine, that. not so much. It's used a lot in the, um, in the uh, suppression, uh, in a lot of the, the drugs now, uh, and the kind of hypno, hypno dumb you down, make you suicide and psychotic. You may have bleeding from the nose and rectum. You may, uh, uh, you know, begin you know, all that kind of stuff. That that all of those have methamphetamine in them. So um, they're they're specifically designed to toxify the body. Anyone who's taken those uh, from your psychiatrist, I would stop going. And you need to go through a detox and try to deal with uh, the trauma or whatever you're dealing with in a real way. And there's ways to do this. There's body work and there's a electromagnetic technology that is hopefully going to be released very soon that will kind of smooth out your your luminous being. I've seen it. I've had metaphysical experiences um, and you have uh, tentacles that come out from your tummy and touch the world. It's On, a, on another level, you don't look like a human body. You're, you're a luminous being and we have what are called fixations that are made to block us from our authentic self and I have them we all have them they're run by the implant matrix and you can become you're the leader the giver the taker the, the whatever and those represent those nine fixations actually represented in the Hindu religion of Kali Kali holds nine skulls in a knife but what that represents is she cutting you off from the nine attachments or the fixations that you can have we have a luminous nature self, and where we place our attention on our luminous body um, determines what we perceive. So there's alternate perceptions and realities, and um, there's a very narrow bandwidth that humanity is kept uh, focusing on, an electronic fence. So that's where the ayahuasca, the psychedelics, and the shaman experiences come from to uh, break those out and um, it's a interesting thing that's it's not recommended because 
you know, negative entities can come in as well. So these days, it's not like the 70s. The electronic fence is very intense. So I don't recommend people going into psychedelics. Um, you have to be under the tutelage of a master in the right situation. You, don't you know, I'm always saying that yeah. too, really. The it's not necessary to, to do that anymore or, you know, use LSD like it might have been in the 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s. Um, you know, the frequencies are a lot stronger now, and I would recommend some of the things you're talking about, but um, the public, we talked about earlier too, you know, the interdimensional space travel, and that we've had it for a long time, and we've had a lot of these techniques you're speaking of for a long time, and I just wonder what kind of outrage there's going to be amongst the general public when they find out that they've been robbed and deprived of all these, you know, when it actually hits them that they've been robbed and deprived of all these um, you know, wonderful things that we should have had available to us long since. Well, we're, we're all influenced by these negative technologies. Um, as Corey said at the conference, we're all mind controlled. You know, not everyone's mind controlled to that extent. We're all under an electronic fence. That's the thing for people to get. There's cell phone towers, there's Gwen towers. The churches have been paid for by the Rothschilds. They put cell phone towers in the steeples of every church, and the Catholic and the the Mormon churches. So, you know, you got this mind control running out amongst the people, and it does not negate the truth in the life of the avatars of Christ or Muhammad or um, Buddha or the many other great spiritual leaders and teachers that have demonstrated uh, positive and powerful um, le led, led uh, grassroots movements for truth, as well as the explained liberation and understanding the the deep secrets of life these things are more esoteric which means hidden and that's just simply because if it's taught openly you get killed or if you become too powerful you get killed but people have been able to achieve high spiritual levels and there's a, uh, a group called the great white brotherhood which is actually a great white brother sisterhood and these are very advanced people spiritual beings from the earth, kind of in a breakaway civilization, who've been working very consciously with humanity to uplift them. Many of them telepathically uh, with humanity. Not like Curry, where they're misleading people, but spiritual contact is made and influence to people who, aren't tele who have telepathic sensibilities, but are, are guided. There's also what we call the night classes. I'd like to talk about uh, Valiant Thor and um, Don Thon, Unaya, Junaya, Yo, and and the Order of Melchizedek. Yes, please do. Okay, so we have um, Dr. Frank Strange's. Uh, I took a guy named Howard Menger to Egypt on what it's called the 1111 in 1991. It's a pretty amazing uh, trip. I sat between uh, Colonel Stevens and uh, Howard Menger on the plane. Um, and bouncing back and forth on the roads and having questions and answers. Our plane left LaGuardia Airport on e at 11.11 11, uh, p.m. It was literally on the frickin' ticket. So synchronicity and the timing abounded. And uh, Howard, who had done a lot of the work in the 40s and took a tremendous amount of heat from the government and worked with them in various aspects, was a tremendous... Uh, uh, spiritual uh, person and he was a tall drink of water probably 6'4", six, 6'6", six, six. and he had his beautiful wife Connie and they had lots of phenomenon and pictures and Howard and, uh, and Val I'm sorry, Valiant Thor Don Thor and the woman named Jill who I actually saw here in, at the Rio where I am right now in Las Vegas um, actually uh, saw her, she appeared and um, you know, they're here walking amongst us and down here, and they're working to uplift us and raise our vibration. Contact is almost available, but we have a lot of, you know, the media, and so people freak out, they become an oddity. So the beginning of the contact, they're just, they're here, they're talking to us, they'll be uh, interacting with different groups, and you won't know who they are, but they'll have a, a positive spiritual presence. Um, there's many um, that live amongst us, many that come and go. And uh, there's many different groups that are able to do this. But Howard uh, told me that they did not introduce 
themselves to him, but he kind of figured they were from Venus at the time. He had had contacts with other uh, Venusians, and they um, he actually got them clothes uh, for them when they first landed, and they gave him he gave them uh, like ID tags so they could duplicate them and walk amongst us and. In his famous meeting, Augie Roberts took pictures of him. Many people reported that Valiant Thor spoke French, Spanish, Russian, and even Zosha, some exotic <coughs> clucking sound. <laughs> There's an African guy there, so uh, his message got out. Um, and he had a picture, and of course, the famous story on my website, The Stranger Pentagon Book, is available, as well as the teachings of Valiant Thor. Um, and it's called Outwitting Tomorrow, and those kind of give the basic teachings of uh, the five-pointed star of life, which is very important to us that we all develop ourselves in a balanced way. And you have five points. The five points are your, um, the first one is your spiritual life, that every day that you acknowledge, you know, you know, kind of like a he who humbles himself shall be exalted, and he who exalts himself shall be humbled. And this is the message when you go into the Great Pyramid, you must drop to your knees to get into the Great Pyramid. So, um, King's Chamber. So, Valiant Thor um, has taught us through Dr. Frank Strange's and Outwitting Tomorrow about the five-pointed star of life. So every day you acknowledge the Creator, you give thanks for your life, and uh, you become humble before God. And the second point of the star of life would be the physical. You must take care of your physical body. You must brush your teeth. You must go to the bathroom. You must eat well. You must exercise. All of those things, the physical point of the star of life. Then you have a, um, uh, a social point. You must contact other people. You can't live by yourself and become all alone, you you will uh, you kind of wither up and get weird ideas and become, you know, talk to yourself, freaky, whatever. You're just by yourself all alone in your head. Um, it's not a balanced way to live. So that's a social uh, star of life. And uh, then they have the financial, and they don't have finances, but they have bartering and service. So they call it the service point of star. So you must be involved in uh, some point of service in your life. Uh, you must, um, you know, work, if it's working in a soup kitchen or, you know, whatever you do, there must be something that you provide of service to others. It can be healing massage, it can be mental work on the internet, it can be whatever you're doing uh, that, that usually provides your livelihood. And so you do that, and then of course there's the mental aspect. You must keep open-minded, you must learn to grow, you must be able to expand your realities and your perception. And that's an important part. So those are the five-pointed star of life. And if you become oversighted in one, like, like I'm kind of a hermit lately. I'm less social. So I could become, you know, pedantic or, you know, less tolerant of other people or this or that because I'm, you know, doing my thing. Uh, the muscle heads. People, all they do is work out the body and look at the mirror and eat right, and that's their life. Um, they may have other points of star and, you know, it's good to take, I always say, the physical body, there's no more worthy goal than to pay perfect homage to the sacred temple of flesh, which is our vehicle for spirit on this plane of existence. And I made that up when I was 20. <laughs> but I really believe that. So, um, you know, and you can't obsess about it. I know people who were vegan and, you know, they, he, was, he was vegetarian and then he was lacto, then he was vegetarian, then he was vegan, now he's raw. And, you know, if you get so involved in that, um, again, your life becomes obsessive compulsive and those people die of cancer anyway. Yeah, don't you think they get hung up on a label? Like, I know I'm a vegetarian, but it's because my body has pushed me towards that. It's not because I'm hung up on a label or a certain cause. I think sometimes people get hung up on a label and are more into the label than the practice of it, you know? Yeah, I think for me, it can be a social thing now. It's like, you want to be right, but everyone's got a different story of what's good and right. And, you know, you've got, you know, they're isolating all of these different foods and activities, which is good. But reality... 
if we just got rid of all of the industrial, uh, you know, the chemicals on our planet and just ate normal healthy foods, we'd be fine. Christ was mostly vegetarian. They did eat fish uh, and they did uh, have lamb occasionally, but they ate a lot of it raw. And he said that, uh, you know, not, not the fish or the meat, but, you know, when he would go to the uh, people at the Siloam pool where the lepers lived to ask, and he would do heat, healings and heat He said, the fire that you put to your food in your bodies now is a fire that you put to your bodies. He says, take off your clothes, lay in the sun, drink pure water, and pray. Eat less, pray more. So it's real simple. We just follow God's laws. We have so many things assaulting us. Like I said, you can be a perfect vegan and live next to a school where they put one of those cell phone towers right next to schools, and you're going to get that frequency. <laughs> you're going to get it anyway, yeah. So everyone's different, and we have to work together here. They work together. They're very organized, the New World Order, and we have to develop our spells. And one of those things is meditation. There's, there's two aspects, two secrets to, med to the spiritual life, I think. One is meditation, mediter, from the Latin, which means wait in the middle. So you wait in the middle of your breath, or you weigh your breath. You balance it. So that's meditation, and that's listening to God. You have to enter into the silence and put away all of the stress and worry of your little mental mind. It's working every day. I got to go to the store. I got to pick up toothpaste. I got to do this. You're running constantly and you come home and you just want to relax and you just turn on the idiot box and just absorb your mind control programming for the day. That's what most people do. So we have to break out of this <laughs> um, a, little, a little bit. Stop, I hear, you go ahead. Stop seeing, yeah, stop seeing spaced out on CNN or Fox News repetitively today, you know, it's it's crazy. Yeah, they just regurgitate the party lines that they want you to remember and know and, uh, um, and, and keep you in fear and unbalanced. So there's, uh, let's say you get too involved in the mental. You become an egghead and closed off and, you know, in the mental world where you're only by yourself. Or too social. The guy that just goes out and lives off of parties and peoples and, and is, you know, he never really accomplishes anything, but he's very friendly. And he's a good talker about nothing, and he just hangs out and doesn't do much. So, and every, so we're all, we, all know, we all know some of those. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, and we have to have compassion. We are fragile human beings. And we think we know something. And as Semyasi said, then you find out you know nothing at all. So be aware that intellectual knowledge is just steps on an endless ladder. And there's soul knowledge and awareness, too. And that comes from, you can get that from the other aspect of the spiritual cross. I think the Christ consciousness represents a balance between two aspects. One is the material and the outer world, and one is the inner. And the other aspect is prayer, talking to God. And just acknowledging in your heart and soul and speaking to the Creator. Now, is the Creator a man on a white throne or whatever? No, it's a black woman. I'm kidding. Anything, <laughs> anything you can say about the Creator limits it. The Creator is infinite creative potential. It's just like uh, if you can imagine looking in the middle of the air and just uh, water dropping or just out of nowhere. Just It's just positive creative potential. And uh, that comes from what we would call the tachyon field, which comes from, in our aspect, in the beginning was the word. Now, that's a creative potential. It moves all of the dimensions and all the particles on all the planes are moved in a, in a complete natural order. And those orders change. So material knowledge is relative. Certain things are true, but they're not always true. There is always something different, and that's where we come into the quantum field where the person who's observing the event influences its outcome by their attention and what their belief system is an understanding, the reality will shift a bit. So uh, let, me get, let me recap a little bit. You've got the five-pointed star of life. You develop those. 
you enter into the silence daily. And that's through the spirit. And the spirit means breath. And so you study Kriya Yoga or the science of the still breath and you weigh your breath in the middle and eventually you can hold your breath for like two days. And I mean, is that a great goal? No, it's just balancing your breath and with the intent of, uh, of connecting to the creator, the creative force. And I don't want to say it as a person, but the one of the highest incarnations was Christ. He was the first person through the door into the law of total forgiveness. And this goes back to your question, what are people going to do? And if they're prepared spiritually uh, using these techniques, they'll be able to adapt. And I think some people are going to be pissed and angry, and a couple of politicians may be hung up by a, a, a street lamp. I don't recommend it, but believe me, uh, I don't think they need they can get away. Uh, I, I'm not for all forgiveness. I think they need to be nailed down, put in prison. Um, I think they need to have crimes against humanity and atone for their actions. And when the higher spiritual forces deem that their soul is truly contrite, like when Corey... Uh, went up there um, with Gonzalez. They said, not humble enough. And then, you know what I mean? So they have ways of knowing if you're contrite and humble. And I may not make it because I got a, uh, I got a sword up my butt for those people. <laughs> and I'm just really upset. You know, I, I really feel like this needs to be handled. One of my previous lifetimes, I was in Rome, and I held a, a sword to Nero's throat to end the carnage. So that's one of my past lifetimes, and I have a, a police-type mentality. I never attack, but I always defend. And that happens, uh, you know, in life. And, you know, here in the thing with, uh, in my service here, I was working on with for Cobra on Prepare for Change, and uh, I created most of the basic content and the concepts. And I was attacked by the people in the council a lot. And um, I eventually just resigned, but... You know, I had to defend myself constantly. There were actually seditious activities based on agendas and lies and manipulation going on behind the scenes, and people are just reacting. You know, it took me a long time to even get the, the leaders to write their mission statements, and they weren't really contributing. And they would, they would attack my contribution, but would not contribute too much. They were offered uh, the passcodes and the keys to do whatever they want, and eventually it just came too much and I resigned. They've really taken it forward now. They've got some uh, a new look on the website. They've gone into detail in a lot of the areas that um, um, I had envisioned originally. Uh, it was a group effort. Uh, some people in the group work more than less than others. Others are um, doing a great job there and uh, some are delegating, some are acting, and it's uh, become more viable now. And it's preparation for the event. So we did have quite a few things that we wanted to do. I wrote the community leaders brief and uh, a lot of the other instrumental information there, and I wish it well to continue on. My idea was to have worldwide groups and universal translators. Um, I had some other things there we we're trying to get going, but um, they definitely have filled in a lot of the blanks and continued on the mission. So, um, you know, that was a hard thing. You know, and then I worked with Cobra, and uh, I haven't really talked about it that much, but um, I had an interview with Cobra, and he kept wanting me to put his interviews up without my comments. And I said, no one tells me what to do with my website. <laughs> And so I stopped doing the Cobra interviews. I, I don't care if I get 15,000 hits a month from his interviews. I'm not going to have anyone tell me how to present my website. His website has, you know, he said, well, you advertise. And they go, well, I talk about my product sometimes a little bit, but there's other information there. His, every time he posts something, he's got advertisements on both sides. So um, I just decided not to do it. We have definitely different ideas on the Christ principle and stuff, but I love Cobra. I think he's brilliant. He is a scientist. He's having real contacts. Um, and um, he has a tremendous amount of knowledge on the skater field fence. And he's getting updates on the world's political situation that's going on behind the scenes from the viewpoint of one group. So 
there's a lot of good information from Cobra. I love him. I think he's great. I don't deny it. Um, I don't think there's any point in him being uh, anonymous now. That's my opinion, but I'll never tell anyone who he is. I've always honored that, and I think that Cobra um, um, is doing a great job, and um, I'm not sure uh, about his it's, you know, one of the guys that's working to tell me that it cures cancer, and they have no proof whatsoever, so I, I'm not really, we need to, there, a lot of research needs to be done on this type of technology. A lot of the technology that he has and that Fred Bell has and I have the pyramids and the crystals and the lasers, the nuclear receptors, the projectors. These things work in the quantum field and they will create changes with the lasers and the Tesla coils combined. There's definitely vortexes and light energy. Spaceships have come, and come down around us to prove it and there's lots of positive information coming out. Is some of this technology as advanced as the Solar Warden Secret Space Program? No. And I'm looking forward for that to come out. The people that Corey works with in that program, he and I have discussed it, you know, they're pretty damaged individuals. They're pretty militaristic. And they said, well, if you do this and do that, we'll heal you. Well, why not heal him and then uh, let him work from a you know, from a gratitude point and, and do some things. But uh, this Solar Warden program group, uh, I think uh, they're going to be removed at some point, and we're going to get the real space program. They'll train us or whatever, and, and they need to get some healing. A lot of them are messed up. The guy they call the Wrangler in Corey's group, um, you know, there's a lot of this stuff going on um, with these negative groups and power and control and it needs to be open and transparent and honest and that's what we're hoping for in the new financial system too so I wanted to go into the other principle called the Christ principle and that's a principle whereby matter conditioned through time and space returns into spirit and that's through a life well lived of a human consciousness so we are the vanguard of spirit. Your soul takes up an earthly body with the idea to transmute your physical corporeal body into a higher frequency of light and eventually you just take it with you. That's called ascension. You know, there are people possibly ascending. Will some people ascend? You know, you know, Corey's thing, the numbers, I'm not really, you know, obviously a lot of people won't quote ascend right now, but it's a process. It's a planetary process. And there will be a, a point in time here where uh, some people call it the harvest. I don't like that term. I call it graduation, where at the end of the day the planet is liberated and we have open communication. And those people who have been trapped here through the thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of the various situations here will be able to return to their home worlds if they want or to go wherever they want, their souls will be able to choose based on free will and um, resonance and vibrational attunement to, to what really would suit them in their soul's growth. So that's coming. But in the meantime, we are the ice breaking the spear tip right now. We have a lot of stuff going on on the planet, and we need to come together as a people. And you can't even get people to come together for lunch. So uh, it's, it's going to be tough, and it's going to take a giant event that's going to get everyone's attention. So there's some spiritual background on this with Dr. Frank Strange's. Uh, there is a, a universal spiritual government that's coming here, and it's not the avians who are going to disappear. It's a group that's going to um, um, explain to us there's a, a spiritual governance uh, and I don't think we have time to go into that, but I, I would like to um, um, give you some time to ask them. Oh, my God, we're at 129, so. Uh, no, no, I think it's been great, man. And I totally, like, the last couple minutes, what you, everything you've said, I, I just got to say for the record, I completely, like, in my instincts, agree with. Um, you know, and I appreciate you kind of taking that stand and, you know, and standing your ground on these issues. It, it's just incredible. I mean... You know, you're, you're right. Far too often, we can't even sit down and have lunch together, much less get together on an idea amongst some of our own like-minded thinking people. So it, it's really important that we keep plugging away. And 
Yeah, Rob, I really didn't have anything more on this particular show. I mean, we could talk forever, but I just really want to do thank you. And man, I'm so grateful that you know you came on, and I was so grateful to have this time with you to be able to, you know, to talk about these things. Yeah, it was, it's my pleasure. I think, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty strong in uh, what I know and what I feel, and and I can, you know, get up there. But look everyone's got a little bit of wrong and some right in them you know cobra you know drake uh, fulford uh ike i mean everyone's got room to grow and to learn and um everyone can continue in their positions of sharing the knowledge they have and, and, and seeking the light and one of the things i'd like to say uh um i'm going to do a little infomercial here my website the promise revealed.com is there um I keep saying it's getting a revamp, but we're trying to get it done. But I'm going to be taking groups to Bolivia next summer, to Machu Picchu, to the uh, Island of the Sun with Louis Martins, the wonderful contactee of both the White uh, Brotherhood and the Confederation. You can look for that if you're interested and start saving your money. It's not cheap. I think the flight down there can run up to 1900 So um, we're hoping to uh, have a, a couple groups of... Um, maybe 14 or 15 people something like that down there uh this next summer i'm not sure i'm going to do the secret space program conference i tried to talk to nasim harriman and he doesn't want to talk to he's been advised by the people who have paid for his money and his projects to not talk to mainstream outside the mainstream because he wants to be accepted by academia i don't get that <laughs> no, that's both. That's yeah. That's, Whatever people have got controllers and handlers, and they're listening. And it's got to be open and transparent. And don't be afraid to say what you got to say. Um, and uh, those people are going to be blown out of the water really quick here, as the real physics and the real reality of interdimensional wormholes and travel through space is revealed uh, to the public at large, where they finally get it. You'll actually get to meet multiple ET groups. Most of them look like us in the beginning, and then the other ones will come forward. No need for fear. Um, hold fast to the truth. And I would say, um, I, I'd like to say for people to remain calm as these changes come. Share with people. Don't be in despair because you find out that the church is a Jesuit-controlled um, you know, pedophile ring. Look at the Colosseum, all the skulls under there and all the murders. The life of Christ stands on its own and there is a message in a, of truth in there and it has to be understood properly and interpreted properly. And there will be, there are chambers opening up including the Dead Sea Scrolls will be revealed. The Jews in Israel have a secret room paid for by the Rockefellers that keep those hidden. 250 translators uh, resigned many years ago because they wouldn't reveal the truth of space contact and what was taking place in those Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a special jar that will be found or soon, if it hasn't, that contains the writings of Christ. It will have a perfume uh, and it will be written, uh, there will be the number 7 on it. So some of these things will be coming forward. There's a giant chamber near Sedona left by the Venusians having uh, information and artifacts. Many of those chambers have been destroyed through cataclysms through the, the years, but there are many that are intact and be brought forward beneath the Himalayas, beneath the oceans. Many of these will be brought forward from South America that will explain the many different races that came here, their influences on the earth, and we have to remain open-minded and allow for the variances and differences of everyone's opinion. And as long as we're nonviolent and continue to treat each other with respect, we can move forward. You know, I recently had a major betrayal issue. I mean, this person, you know, conned some people uh, about me not paying them. Well, I withheld the pay because the person had some, you know, was with. <laughs> <laughs> had taken some money from uh, various people that was not being returned to them and so so I withheld the pay but she played it up like oh I'm not paying her so there's a lot of tax and you get a lot of reason to get upset and freaked out but if it's if it doesn't really stick with you if it's not something that you did you just let it go and, and let it go like water off a duck's back 
On the other hand, you have to really recount your day. At the end of the day, your meditation, did you, were you nice to people? Were you upset? Were you dismissive? Were you short and curt? Did you have anger in your heart? You know, um, were you arrogant? Um, you know, were you violent? Well, I mean, we have to really monitor ourselves, first of all. That's a primary, primary goal, is to become a sweet, humble, loving person and to do unto others as they do unto you. So that's a golden rule, and to love creation with all your might. And there's nothing, there's nothing that we cannot heal or fix if we place the light of God and our own awareness upon that situation. And if it requires sacrifice and pain and suffering, unfortunately, in this time of the world, that's what we must do. And, and sometimes we don't want to do that. We want to put our heads in the sand and go around the problem. And I know your car needs fixing, but there's children starving in Africa. By the way, I'd like to mention I do have a, a donation site for some children in Africa. I've donated $50 a month commitment. And I'd like other people, it takes 400 a month to get these people fed. And I'd like someone else to step up, or several people to step up, to sign on there, and every month give $50 to these kids. $400 or $500 a month can feed 23 children in Tanzania. There's a brilliant guy who's done a great job um, uh, with his uh, orphanage there. People have donated um, materials, and they're building an orphanage. It's pretty basic right now, but it, uh, it can be something great, and I'm looking forward to supporting that. Also, on my website, I have a, under the book section, under products, a free book. It's called The Veil of Invisibility. Go there, download it, and you can see that George Bush Sr. actually was a German-born national and a Nazi spy with his father. His name was George Scherf Sr. and Jr. They became the Prescott Bushes, and uh, they've been running the country through uh, paperclip and uh, the awareness and knowledge of many people in Congress. So we have a big house cleaning to do here. And it can start with this buffoonery of the presidency. Hitler, Clinton, the liar, and the buffoon, uh, you know, Trump. Something else has to happen. I'll, I'm going to vote for a libertarian candidate or something. But um, it's going to be interesting to see if these elections get through. Um, there, Hitler may have died. I mean, there's rumors. Fulford said she's dead. They have clones. There's exotic technology, folks. So... Uh, we have to be aware, but not not afraid. Be scared. Be prepared, not scared. <laughs> hey, yeah, we're just kind of playing this thing out right now, and it will be interesting to see where we go here from here. It's like, okay, then we can move on to the next phase after this election. But, yeah, it, it's just kind of some crazy times right now and greedy. Yeah, I say don't get mad, get naked, but most of the time I'm mad. <laughs> so Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't want to get naked, Rob, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, have compassion for others and uh, continue uh, in your own knowledge and growth and awakening. So many people out there with so much knowledge and experiences, a, a great wealth of knowledge coming forth on websites, on sacred geometry, new tools. I mean, they may not have the, the big uh, awareness now, but they're, you know, from the public or the Internet, but there's a lot of great people out there. I'm contacted every day by... Uh, people who are awake and aware and, you know, you know, utilizing the products and under, wanting to learn the technologies. And um, if we just keep calm and, and remain peaceful. So I'm going to leave it to uh, to you, Larry. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm going to say victory to the light. Uh, peace unto everyone and peace unto this planet and peace unto the universe. And, uh, you know, May may the truth abide in us as we abide in the truth, and, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was incredible, and I, I'm glad to have you on. I could do a whole other show with you just on the hunger issue alone, not only in, you know, not only abroad, but of course here in America too. And I just wanted to say real quick before we wrap up, um, if you want to check out any of our work, you can go to Facebook and go to Pleiadian Groups and Pages page, and that'll give you a whole list of our YouTube channels, our website. Um, and, uh, you know, all our 40 different starseed related groups and um, 20 pages on uh, Facebook, you know the drill, people I've went through it before. 
And again, I'd like to thank Rob for being on, and I'd like to send a shout out to to a couple people you mentioned. Um, the late great Colonel Wendell, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, big influence of you know mine of his readings, and as well as Alex Collier and uh, David Ike. Uh, Thank you for coming up with the problem reaction solution theory, and I know Rob alluded to it earlier. And with that being said, I'll wish everybody a big cosmic dating game kiss, and we're out, and that's a wrap. All right, thanks, Eric.